Yesterday, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky gave an address to the Joint System of Congress as well as meeting with President Biden. Uh, we wanted to bring in Malcolm Nance, counterintelligence uh, expert, uh, who's also been on the ground there in Ukraine. Malcolm, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm glad to be here. Sorry I got a little late, but we're about to have a blizzard, I think. <laughs> No, no problem. That that bomb cyclone is a mess with everybody. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what President Zelensky articulated to Congress and what this means going forward for the war in Ukraine? You know, what President Zelensky did, and it's, it's actually pretty amazing because he has not left Ukraine at all since the beginning of the invasion. He's spoken to other bodies by a teleprompter, and he's had numerous world leaders come to Kiev by train uh, themselves to to discuss their relationships with Kiev. However, this time he took an American offer. He came to the United States and he spoke before Congress really about the essence of what the fight in Ukraine is about. And if there's any one thing that we should know and learn about the, what what is happening in Ukraine is that this is an existential war, not just for the Ukrainian people. Russia fully intends to wipe out Ukrainian culture. They said that they would eliminate Ukrainian dialect, Slavic language, which is very similar to Russia. But for the most part, it's really a war about the end of democracy in Ukraine. Russia cannot have that on its borders. It's a dictatorship. It doesn't want that infection going there. And also control of 25% of the world's wheat. So Vladimir Zelensky came and made an impassioned, historically articulate, articulated speech about how this was America's war, how you could not decouple America and the money that it is donating to Ukraine away from the um, saving American democracy against what we see now as the, the ultra-conservative, ultra-MAGA right. The most of their supporters are supporters of Vladimir Putin and his dictatorship. And Vladimir Zelensky made a very, very good, impassioned plea uh, for America to understand that every dollar that is spent in Ukraine, using his famous phrase, is not charity. It's an investment in a future war you don't have to fight with American service members. And it was a good speech. You know, on that point, many people compared the speech to Winston Churchill's address to a joint session of Congress uh, at the beginning of this uh, special military operation, as the Kremlin calls it. Uh, people expected this to be a three to five day operation. They would do a decapitation strike on Kiev or replace with a puppet government, and Ukraine would turn into a, uh, a subsidiary state, much like uh, much like Belarus uh, or much like many of the other former Soviet republics that were part of the Warsaw Pact. But because of U.S. aid to Ukraine, this has turned into to a, uh, or a year-long struggle where the Ukrainians seem to be winning. You know, we recently had the uh, the Russians flee from Kherson across the Dnieper River. We've seen the counteroffensive in Kharkiv, which has been amazingly successful, uh, regaining territory. Why do you think so many Republicans or have suddenly become the pro-Putin party. And even we saw Lauren Boebert and Matt Gates refusing to applaud uh, Vladimir Zelensky. And now they're calling it everything from money laundering to part of the Hunter Biden laptop scheme. Why are Republicans against defending Ukraine? Well, for a simple fact that uh, three years ago, Donald Trump was impeached for attempting to blackmail and extort Vladimir, Z uh, Vladimir Zelensky uh, when he refused to actually make up an investigation of Hunter Biden at the personal request of Donald Trump via Rudy Giuliani. He refused to do it. And now what we're seeing is the Republican Party went into rebellion against Ukraine. This is not new. Uh, Biden, uh, I'm sorry, Trump understood also, acting as a vassal of Vladimir Putin, that those weapons the money that they were going to release to Ukraine was to pay for the thousand Javelin missiles, the same missiles that broke the Russian invasion at the very beginning of the war. Ukraine would have been rolled over without those missiles. I know. Uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, I've actually been a combatant in this war since last March when I joined the International Legion for the Territorial Defense of Ukraine. I've been a Ukrainian Army soldier this whole time. And I'm going to make something very clear so that no one um, has any uh, misapprehension about what I'm going to say. Ukraine is definitively winning this war. Yes, we are taking casualties. 
My unit just lost three people the other day. But Ukraine is definitively winning this war. And for Ukraine to win this war, it means that you are humiliating Donald Trump's personal mentor and uh, essentially the person who put him into power in the United States. And since Trump didn't get his way by extorting Zelensky, he didn't get his way by helping and supporting Putin by dismantling NATO, which is much stronger, that means anything Donald Trump hates, the Republican Party hates. And they have now become the party of dictatorship and have aligned themselves essentially against a country which has had nine democratic elections, whereas Vladimir Putin's uh, Russia has had two. And, uh, and they elected a KGB officer who will now have none. You know, we're seeing continued shelling in Bakhmut, where uh, also the nuclear plant of Zaporizhia uh, has continued to be under attack. Uh, it's very much the weapons sent by the American people uh, that are maintaining the ability of the Ukrainians to fight. You know, if it was not for, as you said, the Javelin missiles, which have destroyed uh, many of the uh, T-72, T-60, T-90 tanks that the Russians uh, really used as the head of the spear, the Stinger missiles that have taken out many of the Hind helicopters. Uh, now we have Patriot missile batteries, which are being deployed deployed to Ukraine. President Biden promised another, I think, $1.8 billion. But you have many people, even in the African-American community, questioning the amount of monetary aid going to Ukraine. Uh, why is so much money needed for the defense of Ukraine? And how can it be justified, given the needs of the American people here? And uh, when we're, we're, we, we tend to argue about dollars and cents down to the nickel in American budgeting, but many people sen seem to think that Ukraine simply has an uh, unlimited uh, debit card where they can take as much money as they need for their defense. Why is that justified? Well, let me put it this way. Right across the border from western Ukraine in a, in a small town called Zhuzhov, Poland, right, where there is a U.S. Army 82nd Airborne Combat Element operating, about 20 to 25 percent of those troops are African American or Latino American, people of color. If Ukraine had fallen, those soldiers would have been in combat with Russia. So we have to make some strategic decisions here. Ukraine asked for only one thing from us, as a democracy which was defending itself against the totalitarian dictator who launched the largest war in Europe since Adolf Hitler invaded the Sudetenland in 1939. They asked us for weapons. We spent over two trillion dollars in Iraq and Afghanistan fighting essentially guys who were wearing flip-flops and making a very, very large uh, defense uh, industry very happy over 10 years. That's not what's happening here. This is the war you've always feared would happen in Europe. It's just that, you know, once Ukraine were, were to fall, 25 percent of the world's wheat falls into Russia's hands. A dictator has shows that direct force actually works. What you would have seen was a cascading series of political bodies around the world move away from our style of democracy towards Vladimir Putin's autocracy. This is a war on what ideology will dominate the world, one where people are, uh, are led by those who are voted in by the consent of the governed, or one where a dictator just gets to walk in anywhere he wants and take what he wants. Uh, look, Donald Trump was essentially a mini Vladimir, uh, you know, Vla uh, Vladimir Putin. And for Trump and his ilk, again, who were there, they were going to dismantle NATO and body a defense body which the United States created in 1947 for Vladimir Putin. So the war that is being fought in Ukraine right now, every dollar you're spending is not 50 or 100 or $1,000 you would have to spend to defend Poland or Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania or Finland as part of a NATO alliance. Right now, the weapon systems that we're selling in Ukraine, it's not just the United States. 32 nations, all of Europe, the European Union, are all sending weapons to Ukraine. Another thing that we're doing here is we're learning just how intense combat would be fighting against a nation state, a near-peer adversary such as Russia. 
Trust me, I have been bombarded by Russian rockets, Russian artillery. My command post took a direct hit by a, 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 a weapon system that fired 40 kilometers across the Russian border. This is a war we don't want to fight, all right? We win it. Our weapon systems are definitive. The Russians have no army to speak of. They're actually a, a horde of literally orcs, people who came to Ukraine to steal what they could and are dying in droves. These are bodies, the Ukrainians themselves are taking losses, over 13,000 dead. These are people who are not Americans. Americans do not have to die fighting off totalitarianism. Now, we spent a lot of money in a lot of places in this world, but I think this is one of the best investments in American history. We cannot afford to allow democracies to be rolled over by dictatorship, or it's going to happen to us anywhere, and you're going to see U.S. forces in combat everywhere. Can you talk a little bit about the uh, the kind of dominoes that fall if Ukraine was to fall to Russia? Because if he did, as uh, Monica Crowley on Fox News suggested, and cut off all uh, aid to Ukraine tomorrow, as uh, some Republicans have been saying, Matt Gates and Boebert and others, uh, you'll be looking at, one, uh, Russia will be able to finally close that gap between Kherson and uh, Odessa, cutting off that port, which is the last remaining port that is able to uh, go uh, deliver goods into the Black Sea. They'll be able to connect the corridor from the Donbass all the way to Transnistria and Moldova, uh, you will see a situation where Belarus will be uh, uh, newly encouraged to maybe invade from the north. What are the dominoes that would happen if we stopped supporting Ukraine? Well, I mean, it's not so much dominoes. And right now, because of where Ukraine is, it would just be a matter of attrition. Um, maybe two, three years before Russia would finally wear down the Ukrainians to where their combat capability would be so degraded without the support of the United States and the rest of NATO that they would start losing mass paces of terrain. Of course, Russia would be losing 200, 300, 400,000 dead. I, you know, and trust, I, I'm saying, trust me, I was a combatant there. Those guys are nothing but cannon fodder. Very few of them are actually skilled troops. But when you're putting a thousand to one out or a thousand to two out, it's a little hard to maintain your ground. Listen, when the Republican Party says they should cut off aid, they are just being the traitors that they have identified themselves to all the values that of the founding fathers that they claim to honor. We are a democracy, a republic, which is a democracy in which the rights of the minority are protected. That is not what they are for. Donald Trump, and I wrote this in one of my, uh, you know, my better read books, The Plot to Destroy Democracy. Donald Trump is a member of what we call the axis of autocrats. He believes that Vladimir Putin's solitary style dictatorship, that President Xi of China, he congratulated him on the day that he received um, the ability to rule forever without elections. This is a man who was literally said he was in love with a North Korean dictator. For African Americans, if you think you would have it bad now, or you had it bad over the last six years, because let me tell you, we're in the best economy since uh, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama's economy. If you think it was bad under Trump, imagine everything bad that happened to you being law. This is the party that you're up against now. They want to overturn all of America's alliances since World War II. That would literally betray the very reason that we landed at Normandy, would be to install a totalitarian dictatorship and run a nation based on white supremacy. So for anyone who says, hey, you know, we didn't get our school funding here in the United States, you're right, you didn't. Because the, it has nothing to do with the defense budget. It has to do with they want to d dismantle the Department of Education. They will dismantle everything that the African-American community has ever worked towards since the civil rights era. In fact, they had their way. They'd roll back the civil rights era. So every dollar spent defending Ukraine as the eastern wall of democracy saves us from having to fight in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, and Finland, the countries which all have a border with now apparently an out-of-control Russia. Good investment. You know, 
You know, we're, we keep saying all uh, week after week, Europe seems to be hedging closer to autocracy. Uh, if you look at what's happening in Europe, uh, Israel right now, Netanyahu just installed the most uh, right-wing government in the nation's history. If you look at Italy, where Giorgio Maloney uh, has installed a neo-fascist party, which worships Mussolini all of a sudden. If you look at the uh, the government there in the UK, uh, where you had Liz Truss and Boris Johnson running a right-wing government, is Europe headed towards a position where these right-wing autocrats become the uh, become the standard and not the deviation. You know, again, I wrote a book in 2018 called The Plot to Destroy Democracy. One thing that most people didn't realize until they took their shot at trying to take uh, put the American government into the hands of an autocrat is that United Russia, Vladimir Putin's party, since um, since 1992, if I'm not mistaken, um, when Putin, after Putin became, uh, no, not 1992, excuse me, 2002, after Vladimir Putin became president, started funding right wing extremist conservative parties all around Europe. The nations you spelled out, those are the least of them. The government in Italy, yes, it is a fascist based prime minister, but the actual government is very liberal, progressive, and will not allow that prime minister to do anything other than sit around as a female Mussolini. Uh, the government in Israel, well, we all know that there's not much we can say about that. But, you know, Israel really started becoming extremely radical after the Russia, the, the Jewish diaspora from Russia started moving there and created some of the most extremist political bodies uh, there. And you see how they, they treat people. Uh, you know, I, I, I lived in Israel. I worked in Israel. It is not the same Israel that it was 30 years ago. Completely different country, very heavy Russian influence to the point where they won't help Ukraine. Uh, in Great Britain, you know, their uh, their Brexit uh, referendum was heavily influenced by Russia and Cambridge Analytica at the same times that these uh, same activities were going on, uh, trying to pump up Donald Trump in the United States and, uh, you know, essentially hack the mindset of the American public through social media engineering. Uh, but those are some of the least governments in there. The government of Austria in 2017, which was a party that was founded by two Nazi SS officers in 1952, won the presidency with the help of United Russia, who immediately opened ties with them. Uh, the government of Hungary, Viktor Orban, is more aligned with Vladimir Putin almost than he is with NATO. There are many, many other governments, but this is part of Vladimir Putin's long-term strategic plan to flip Western democracies into autocracies. And fortunately, this has been seen, and the United States, for the most part, uh, is holding on by fingernails to, its, uh, to the democracy that it was founded to be, and we are pushing back against that autocracy. But the Republican Party wholly owned subsidiary of an ex-KGB officer. So how does this war end? You know, I, I, I don't think anybody thinks that the, the Ukrainian army can do a river crossing and push uh, the Russians out of Crimea down to Sevastopol. I don't think uh, that uh, the U.S. is going to supply them with the types of offensive weapons. You know, uh, Zelensky has asked for Abrams tanks and for Leopards from Germany, uh, from Challenger tanks from Great Britain. Uh, is there a diplomatic solution? Is there an agreement that can be, come to, uh, can be considered? Because the Russians are saying, are saying they're not going to give back the Donbass, they're not going to give back back Luhansk, and they're not going to get back Crimea. And uh, uh, Zelensky has said that he wants all those territories back and to redraw the lines to 2014. How exactly does this end, or is it just a continuous decade of war like we saw in Chetsky in the 90s? Let me let me explain something very clearly, all right? Uh, I am a Ukrainian Army soldier. I was part of the 3rd Battalion International Legion Special Forces. I took part in the offensive operation in Kharkiv province that took back the entirety of the northeast of Ukraine. I was in the first. First. The capability of fighting the way that they need to fight to get back across those rivers. We are actually right now about 30 percent into Luhansk province from a direction that the Russians can barely control the northeast. You have to remember that the Russians dominated that space. 
they are in a position now that within the next year, they will lose uh, uh, Luhansk, possibly Donetsk, all of Kherson province, and most likely Zaporizhna. It's quite possible we could be back in Mariupol in a year on the banks of Crimea. Um, there is one thing that can that Vladimir uh, Vladimir Zelensky can propose to Russia as part of a of a peace deal that will be acceptable to the pe Ukrainian people. I've spoken about it many times uh, with members in the Ministry of Defense, and it's quite simple. We make this proposal: the unconditional surrender of Russian forces in Ukraine, and we will turn their soldiers over to the handling of the International Committee of the Red Cross. Because only two outcomes are going to happen in this war. Russia's army is going to be broken, and they are breaking now. They are barely holding on. Their mobilized forces are going out there wearing World War II and Soviet-era uh, helmets, rifles from the 1950s. We have the equipment, not just the stuff that we have from the United States. It is as simple as this. We have the heart to bring this war to a horrible, terrible conclusion if the Russians want it. But for now, they have an option. They can turn around and walk home back to the Russian border, or they can be destroyed. And I think Zelensky is speaking from a position of strength because he sees the writing on the wall, and so does everyone else, which is why we're giving them the weapon systems they need. The tanks that he wants, the Challenger, the Leopard, the Abrams, those tanks, those advanced weapon systems will come to Ukraine, but more than likely once a ceasefire or once uh, Russian forces mm -hmm. have been pushed out of their borders. Malcolm, for all that you've done in updating us, you know, can't get more uh, uh, more update information than you being on the front lines. We thank you for everything you, uh, you're you doing. Uh, make sure you keep us updated. We'll have you back on. Thank you so much, Malcolm Mann's counterintelligence expert. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. All right, folks, back to that whole Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollinsmartin.com. 